Hi, I'm Captain Tom Bucci. I run a charter boat in Montauk. It's called the Mystique. Um, I, I'm not going to pretend to be an authority and know everything, but I'm just going to tell you what works for me and what doesn't work for me. Um, I've been involved in the charter business since 92. Um, I do about 30 to 50 trips a year, plus I can pin hook some species commercially. So I'm, go I'm looking at about a thousand trips now in the last 30 years. So I'll tell you some of the things that have worked for me and, and haven't worked for me. So as far as fishing on the East End, where I, I go out of Montauk, but I'll go as far west as Gardner's Island, Cherry Harbor. I'll go far as north as Rhode Island, um, Fisher's Island. I'll go as far east as um, uh, the Suffolk Wreck. We go as far south as the Ranger. So it's really kind of east end fishing. But if you're, if you're really into fishing, there's really like four things that I think you should keep in mind. Um, number one is you got to find the body of fish. So lures and line and, and all these things really are not as important as finding the body of fish. And the other thing is to estimate what's the best tide. What's really the best tide to be fishing to catching fish? And um, I'm going to go over that and I could go pretty in depth with that but I'll try to contain myself to try to talk more about every species that you could catch in Montauk or that I fish for from April till December. And Another thing is don't be afraid to break the rules. Go fishing when you can. Because there's one thing that if I look at my data, there's one thing that will make you catch more fish than anybody else. And if I look at my logbooks, 30 years of keeping data on when I could catch fish, there's one thing that stands out that will put more fish in the bucket than anything. Do you know what it is? Getting out there. Getting out, go during the week. Go during the week. Weekends, it tends to be a little off because there's a lot of boat traffic. So many, oh man, you should have been here yesterday. But you know what? The other thing is go when you can go. You know, I tell people also, lower your expectations and you have a good day. Okay, you know, if you come out to Montauk, the odds of you catching a trophy are greater, but you're not always going to catch a trophy. So if you go consistently though, the odds are definitely in your favor. So, um, don't be afraid to break the rules because you could study tides, you can spend thousands of dollars in tackle, and there's going to be some little kid on the beach that caught a 50 pound bass on a bunker head. So just, you know, go when you can, have fun. And I, I'd want to talk a little bit about um, current. So I'm a little old school, and again, I got to do a little plug for my boat, okay? Mystique Sport Fishing Charters, I go out of Montauk. 31 foot JC. Um, before this, I had a 29 foot Dyer. So again, I've been doing this since 92. But uh, the, the thing that I have to point out, the one thing that really made a difference in my fishing was I found this thing. I, I, I'm kind of a brain picker. I ask people, how do you calculate the tide? You want to go fishing, you want to be, all right, I found the body of fish, but they're not always going to bite. So you have to know the difference between tide and current. This is a book called The Eldridge Tide, Eldridge Tide and Pilot Guide. You can buy it at West Marine. You can buy it off the internet. And it's, um, I, I forgot to bring it. I was going to bring it. It's a little book. And it has a lot of data and a lot of tide things in it. So if you really want to understand how to catch fish, you really have to understand tide and current. Realize that tide means the water going up and down. And current means that the water is going back and forth horizontally. So that's a big difference, because if you're a surf casting, you want to know the tide when it's going to be high and low. But if you're in a boat and you're up at Montauk Point and you're at Great Eastern Rock, the water is going to go in different directions and you want to put yourself in the right time. And the way that you figure that out, for me, is with this book. And what I like a book. I like to sit in a chair with a comfortable book on a rainy day or this thing ends up in the bathroom. That's okay. You know, you, but um, you're looking at different tides and currents, and you have to understand that current is separate than tide. And I was always puzzled about this. And how, how is this possible? So uh, in this book, if you look on page 100, um, and again, I could get this on my Garmin plotter. You can get apps that give you this. But personally, to have a book where you look it up just makes me comfortable. And if you look in this book on page... Um, 93. This is called the current table. This is Montauk Point, and it gives you 
the current. Now understand that the current is about five hours and 50 minutes. It's gonna go, and if it's coming in, it's called flood. It's the incoming tide's called flood, outgoing tide's called ebb. Okay, and they're basically, depending on the stage of the moon, it's gonna be about five hours and 50 minutes per tide, and then it's slack for about 50 to 60 minutes, and then it starts going in the other direction. So that's the current going in and, in and out. So certain stages of the tide are better than others. Sometimes you want flood tide, sometimes, but the thing I really want you to understand is wind against the tide or wind with the tide is gonna really affect the way the bait is presented and the boat flows. Now, in the Eldridge Tide book, everything is based on the race. The race is a spot between Race Rock and Fishers Island. So this is telling me on the race, but then I could calculate different points in Long Island Sound off the race. So the, the, thing, the main thing I wanna show you is, if you look here, it says four hours after ebb. Now, I know you can't see that that great, but these arrows on the point are actually going in, and the arrows by Fishers Island are going out which means I have the current going in opposite directions even though it's still dropping. How the heck is that happening? I'm at Montauk Point, I'm under the lighthouse and the current is going in, but according to the tide table, it says that it's dropping. How is that possible? And I used to ask people all over the place and there was a woman earth science teacher who finally told me how it works. And if you think of Long Island Sound as a toilet bowl, spinning around as the tide is going out and you have current just like in a flushing the toilet bowl if it's spinning around even though the water's going down it's going in different directions so even though you are at the point and the tide's going down the current might be going in so that's why you have to calculate your current so if you look in newsday or you look at high tide really what you want to look at for boat fishing is current and if you look here, there's another table, and if you look at the current on, okay, flood starts at 3.30, and the current's gonna be 3.5 knots, but however, on this day, on the 19th, it's 4.2 knots. So the velocity of the current is gonna change by the phases of the moon. And again, I don't want, I don't want to get too boring, and uh, if you want me to talk more about this, I certainly will at the end. But just realize that, look up the current, understand the velocity of the current, because if you're at Montauk Point and you have wind against the tide and you have a four knot current and you have wind against the tide on a, on a just a plain calm day, you're gonna have like a three foot rip on a, on a spring tide, which means a new moon or, or a, a full moon. And if you put a little wind on that, it could get downright treacherous, wind against the tide. Whereas if you have wind with the tide, Sometimes you could be in windier days and, and the waves won't get as big. So understanding current is a big thing. Um, so the other thing is, why are these velocities changing? And this is another, uh, this, is, this is actually the page of where you could calculate um, different points based on the race. Again, I would look at Montauk 1.2 miles east of. It's um, minus an hour 20 plus two, I think it says. Right, it's a little blurry, but you would subtract that from the current table on that page that had um, the currents off the race. Again, if you really want me to explain this, I'd be more than happy to. I don't know. I'll be honest with you, this is one of my first seminars. I don't know what the interest of this is, but again, this is key. And if you look at, this is the stages of the moon, day by day, month by month. And understand that if you are on a full moon, you're gonna have the strongest currents or if you're on a new moon, you're gonna be on a strong current. That's called um, spring tides. Or if you're in between on the quarter moons, the current is not gonna be as strong because the moon is pulling the current. And those are the days when uh, the current's not as strong. So if I wanna fish an area that doesn't have real strong current, like maybe the west side of Fisher's Island, if I'm there on a spring tide, like a new moon or a full moon, the bottom's gonna come alive. Okay, that actually is going to stimulate all those bait fish because the current's really moving. Whereas if you go there on a, on a different tide, a different phase of the moon, like a quarter moon, uh, a neap tide, it's going to be dead. And you're going to be like, oh, I didn't catch anything. Uh, I had one trip, you know, now I told you I have a food fish permit, so I can also commercial fish. And there's cer for certain species, not all, but I, my passion, I'm going to talk about blackfish. I love blackfishing. 
Um, I can commercial fish blackfish. I had, and the, the limit for that is 25 fish a day. I went out, all legal, blackfish tags. I caught 25 blackfish. Called my buddy. The black fishing was great. I was off of Fisher's Island. We went back the next day. Another 25 blackfish. I went back the next weekend with a charter. Nothing. Skunked. And which is, and it's a long ride too. I, you know, I had egg in my face. But again, live and learn. And again, I'm going to try to tell you some of the things that do work. And again, it was all current. It was the opposite. It was the opposite current. And just realize that a strong current will make a bottom come alive but then again certain spots like southwest ledge uh, you have wicked current and if you have a full moon and you're at the peak of the tide you might need 16 ounce sinkers to hit bottom so a little bit on current now as far as fishing goes it's April you had a long winter I want, I love to go to Cherry Harbor, which is on the west side of Gardner's Island. And the porgies in there, for some reason, I think they spawn. They go in there and they spawn, and it's only 12 feet, 15 feet deep. There's not a lot of bo uh, rocks. It's very sandy, and it's kind of like a big circle. And I think they go in there to spawn and as soon as the spring comes, the leaves are out. If you start mowing your lawn and you see the azaleas blooming, that means the porgies are at Cherry Harbor, in my, in my mind. And I lighten, light tackle, and the more fishing I do, the more I like bottom fishing. I love porgy fishing. And what we do, again, this was a pin hooking trip. You know, if you caught this many porgies, we'd have to work out something in advance about cleaning them. Uh, but what I do is I'll get some of the big giant ones that we catch. I put them in a bucket. I bring them home for home consumption. And to clean a porgy, what I do is I fillet it, put it down on the table. There's a pin bone. I put my knife this way and this way, zip, and I just get a full chunk out of the big porgies. Absolutely delicious, a very underrated fish. Porgy fishing is just lots of fun. And again, bring kids. Bring kids fishing. If you can bring kids fishing, and porgy fishing is a lot of action and it's, it's a lot of fun. So we start out the season in Cherry Harbor, porgy fishing. You can see we get, we get a couple of big ones mixed in. You have to chum. So if you go fishing at Cherry Harbor, there's not a lot of structure. You put the chum down and it's, it's, it's a lot of action. Weak fish are mixed in. Okay, I don't get a lot of weak fish in Montauk, but in the spring if you're anchored and you see some fish start jumping have a little spoon ready to go to cast out and you could get you could hook up with some nice weak fish which is always uh, a bonus like we used to catch tons of these ba back in the bay uh when i used to be a clam digger you know in, in the 80s but it's kind of rare to see them they seem to be making somewhat of a comeback but that's in april and now we're going into may i'm going into may and I'm off Montauk Point and I start to see birds. Okay, pollock rip, um, elbow, south of the elbow. I see birds and at this time there's bluefish that come in and it's like clouds of bluefish on the machine, dropping diamond jigs, lots of fun. It gets to be like stupid good fishing where you catch tons of these bluefish. Um, in between, and again, the moving tide is really the best. If the water's slack, I'll go and I'll start trolling. And again, I could talk a lot about different things and I could give an entire seminar on uh, wireline trolling. Uh, a lot of action. If you, if you really want to, as a captain, and I have people that walk on the boat, I have to bend the pole like right away immediately. I find that I want you to catch fish. Like if I could get fish in the boat in the first 15 minutes of the trip it's like whoosh, pressure's off so you know if i go out and i put out the wire i put out the umbrella rigs everyone takes a turn in the gimbal seat and they have a great time and then we everyone's eyes are everyone's arms are tired in the first hour i'm like all right this is gonna be a fun trip now and trolling wire basically wire line 100 feet out you go 10 feet down so if you're going to be 30 foot of water you want to have 300 foot out. Maybe bring it up a little. You don't want to catch bottom. You have to watch your ground over speed. 
if you're trolling into the tide, if it's a three knot current and you want to try to maintain three knots, you'll notice you're only doing one knot, you're going to snag bottom. So watch your speed as you're trolling, but basically wireline trolling, I like to do that at, the, at slack water, I'm covering ground and umbrella rigs, you know, catch three, four bluefish at a time sometimes and it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. May, end of May into June and then you start to get a little mix of striped bass. Now these pictures are from last year. You know, some of these, I have some older pictures, uh, but, you know, the, this is all like 21, 22. So, again, we had some striped bass mixed in with these bluefish. As the season progresses and the water warms up, the bluefish tend to disappear, and you have a shot at monster trophy bass at Montauk. Again, this, this, this is all 21, 22. I start to use live bait now. I'll troll the umbrella rigs at, at um, slack, but then once the current's moving, uh, a live eel, um, live porgy, has to be a legal porgy, not, you know, has to be big enough that it's legal. Um, but again, you get these giant sized bass in the end of June to the middle of July. Again, I look at my Eldridge Tide book, I look at the new moon or the full moon in June, and that's when you want to try to, if you want to catch these trophies. Now, there's a slot limit on bass now. You ha they have to uh, be small, they have to be between 28 and 35 inches. So the big giant ones, we let go, and I, I try to uh, resuscitate them with my live well pump. I slide them out my tuna door. My boat has a tuna door, which I actually use my tuna door for more releasing than catching, because I kind of slide them gently out. But you know, with these big fish, after everyone catches a couple, I try to do something else, because I really don't like to catch them, and because and then, sometimes you see them, they'll float upside down, because it's such a, a change of depth for them. And sometimes I'll get them and I'll, I'll get them to, to go under so that they don't float upside down. But uh, generally speaking, if the water's cold, um, we do get a, uh, a pretty good rate of them swimming away strong. Uh, in the middle of the summer, when it's really hot, I tend to uh, try not to, if, if, if we're catching these giant sized ones, I, I actually try to stay away from them just to, uh, so I, I don't really like when they float upside down when you release them. Um, so again, this was on a live eel. We were trolling, we caught a bunch of bluefish, and at the end of the tide, I went to live bait, and this guy was very happy when he caught this fish. Um, now, we also get a shot of bluefins. Okay, so that's intro fishing uh, in the early summer. Bluefish, striped bass, porgies. Um, sea bass, again, I go for them commercial. But I really don't really focus on them till later because I think the season is sometimes not open till later. But we do get a shot of bluefin tuna coming through in um, the end of June to middle of July. And there's been times when it could be stupid good. Like it's like at CIA a couple of years ago, there were these bluefins and, you know, they were there. And, and we would just use, and again, not really that important of what lure you were using at that time, we found the body of fish. I'm old school, I like using green machines, clones, birds, uh, maybe a rig ballyhoo. Um, I kind of keep it simple, seven lines, high speed lures. Um, and this is all lure fishing, high speed trolling for bluefins. So that will sometimes put a bluefin steak on the grill for Father's Day. I've done that. Where you, you get a bluefin and it's like, wow, you know, we got the barbecue coming tomorrow. Basically, I bleed these, we ice them, we flay them, we, we stake them up. Teriyaki sauce, 10 minutes, put it on the grill, three minutes aside, bluefin, Father's Day. Um, you also get a shot at sharks. Now, once the water gets to be 68 degrees, you start to get sharks. I used to do a real lot of shark fishing. Nowadays, I don't, people aren't doing it as much, but <clears throat> we still go and you can't keep Makos anymore. So if you see pictures of Makos, this was before they shut the season. So shortfin Mako right now is closed. So that is all catch and release. Blue sharks, we let them go. Nobody likes to eat a blue shark. They urinate through their skin. You can't eat a blue shark catch and release but tell you the truth if you've never gone shark fishing and you get you know a 200 pound blue shark on the end of the line it's a lot of fun
first couple of times that you do it. Um, and you do have a shot at threshers. Now, the shark fishing has changed in my eyes from when we used to go 20, 30 miles, full day shark trip, three cans of chum. I think what has happened is the bunker have become so prevalent because they've regulated some of the industrial boats. There's a lot of bunker around. The sharks are closer to the beach now. Uh, we've been doing eight, nine mile shark trips. I actually do something now called a half day shark trip. And it's fun for kids. You don't have to go out crazy early. Um, we, we had one trip, we had a minky whale under the boat entertaining us. We caught a bunch of sharks. And this was actually a thresher that we kept. Um, and this was two years ago, not last summer, the summer before. This fish, this thresher was caught about six miles to the, off the beach. And thresher shark is very good to eat. There's a moratorium on them because you can't sell them. So you don't see them in the restaurants, but they're better than Mako. They're very, very good um, table fare. Um, and those are le legal to keep. Uh, again, we, 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 we used to keep Makos. Now we release them. And again, you have a tussle with a mako, and it's it's pretty it's pretty entertaining, uh, but again, you got to release them. This is actually a great white shark. Okay, I caught this two years ago off of Heather Hills. I was this this particular this is about a hundred pound great white shark. It was we could see people and surfers on the beach as we were catching this great white shark. It's about a hundred pounds, and He's got some nasty choppers, and it, I find that there's more and more sharks very close to the beach, especially towards the end of the summer. Um, so, fluke fishing. That's another thing. Now, years ago, I found the fluke fishing was better early in the season. May and June. What I'm finding lately, the trend has been when it gets really super hot, you got the dog days of summer, that's when I start catching the big fluke, and we focus on them. Um, as far as fluke fishing goes, I find that I like to fish fluke fishing wind with the tide together. You want to cover ground. That's just me. You know, other people might think it's different, may do different things. I have caught fluke at slack water, jigging bucktails, but again, as a charter boat captain, I want to put the I want to put some fish in the cooler. I want the poles bent. I like a strong current. Now, if you fish in Montauk, the prevailing wind is southwest. So most of the time, if you have a flood tide, and again, you look at the Eldridge Tide book, you say, when's the tide going to be flooding? You have a southwest wind, you're going to have wind with the tide on the south side. The tide, the current, the current goes from west to east. So you have a southwest wind, you're going to be going with the current. If the tide's going out, an ebbing tide, personally, I like the fish on the inside, shagwong, out of shagwong, into shagwong. If you have a ebbing tide and usually a west wind, you're going to have wind with the tide. I don't catch as many fish up there, but the 10 pound fluke that I've caught, they've been on the inside. Kind of interesting. So, and again, we could do a whole seminar. Um, I tend to like to use um, old school regular fluke rigs. If the current's really moving, I do like to use a fluke ball with a teaser on top of it. Um, if I have a family group out, and again, this, this particular fish was kind of funny. This, this guy, we were bass fishing, and this particular guy was not get, doing well with the bass. He got skunked. He ended up catching this eight-pound fluke. We put the fluke on the desk, deck, and it actually flipped, opened the tuna door latch, the door swung over, and the thing was almost going to jump out of the boat. I jumped on top of it. And we were able to get it in the boat, so um, that 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 was kind of a fun day. Um, again, big sea bass. I'll, I'll go. F I'll talk about those. Um, that's later, like in July. But as far as um, fluke goes, what I do like to do is on a uh, on a family trip. Let's say I get kids. Get a bunch of kids. I'll give everybody a fluke rig, except for the youngest kid. The youngest kid, I'll give them. A clam rig and so here we are drifting so dad you know you're gonna try to catch a big fluke dad but you know the little guys I'm gonna give 
a porgy rig and the pole keeps bending. Oh, you got one, you got one. They keep bending, bending. So the kids have all kinds of action. They're having lots of fun. Dad's trying to catch a doormat. He's over here. And, you know, we end up catching a bucket full of porgies and sea bass and, and a couple of big fluke. So that's kind of a, a nice family day. Um, that's like under the radar tower. Um, now, as far as sea bass goes, again, another one of my passions. I love bottom fishing. Again, this is one species I can pin hook. I do sometimes go out and catch, you know, whatever, whatever the limit is. I can't always catch the limit, but um, to do that on a charter, it used to be bluefish would save the day. Sea bass really have been bending the pole, very consistent, very good table fare. Um, I like to use clam bait to start off with. Here's a little uh, tip two, uh, clam bellies, much less expensive than clam. I like to use clam too, but clam belly, very messy. The stuff is, gets all over the place, but these things can't not eat them. The other thing I like to use with sea bass <laughs> is mackerel. There's been some chub mackerel around where if you catch a couple of these chub mackerels, if you chunk them up and put them on the hook for sea bass, nice big bloody piece of mackerel, you end up catching a nice giant sized sea bass. So they like the meat. So sea bass fishing, um, I like, the, there's certain spots that I like real moving water. There are certain spots where it's good at the slack. So what I like to do, and again, calculating your currents. If you're bass fishing, the tide is moving, the current's moving, it goes slack. Go under the lighthouse, go some rock, put on some clam, and you'll catch some giant porgies. And again, you're bending the pole during the slack water. It's a lot of fun, and sometimes you'll get some big sea bass too. So generally speaking, when the tide is slow, I'll go up high on the rock piles with bait to catch sea bass. If the tide's moving, the current's moving, I'll go to deeper areas and I'll use um, bait. And also we've been using some diamond jigs, pink ladies. I have a couple of special poles that I use that are very light just for uh, jigging sea bass using no bait. And what's nice about that is you don't have to fool around with all the little fish. You tend to catch the bigger fish. You don't catch as many, but you catch some of the bigger fish um, using the diamond jigs and the pink ladies. Okay, lots of sea bass. So, all right, so now we're going, we're in the summer, we're into the middle of August. We're starting to do some tuna chunking now. So we were doing trolling. I said the bluefins come in. I'm trolling, 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 July, August. Now I'm into the middle to the end of August. Years ago, we used to go behind the draggers and get the bycatch and throw the bycatch out and use that for bait. Not as many draggers anymore. And uh, things just seem to be changing, but there was some spots um, southwest of the, uh, the windmills off of Block Island, and the bottom was paved with live bait. So what we did is we would troll in the morning, seemed like an early, early morning bite, and then when everything slowed down, we started catching live bait off the bottom and using that, and, we, and there were blue fins and yellow fins. This is a yellow fin tuna. This we caught this August. Um, 